Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life. YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent, commercial-free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad-free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi, or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Hello, fellow armchair historians. Welcome to the last episode of our 2021 Halloween series. Today, I get to talk to DC by Foot tour guide, Melissa Gilbert. Melissa specializes in the ghosts of Georgetown. Today, she shares with us some of the DC neighborhood's spooky tales. Originally from Bullhead City, Arizona, Melissa Lee Gilbert has spent her career working in theater, arts, and education, but a lifetime of pursuing the arts as they relate to the human experience. Her work as designer, artisan, and educator has spanned numerous genres, disciplines, and locations. Melissa Gilbert, welcome, and thank you for being here today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, and so is my cat, because he literally just jumped up on my lap. Oh, buddy. Oh, I used to have a, a cat similar in coloring. So this is going to be one of our Halloween episodes for the season. And I had originally talked to uh, Candon about doing this, and then she referred me to you. And so I'm just going to ask the question, what is your favorite history that we're going to be talking about today? Yes, we're going to be talking about all the things I don't have time to talk for on tours. I love getting to do all of that research, but because it's a time limit, there's so many things that I don't usually get to deep dive in. And that's what I think is the most exciting um, in whatever it is I'm talking about. Okay. And um, we'll talk more later about your tours, but I will tell you that, I don't know if you know this, I also do tours I do yeah. ghost tours in Georgetown, but it's the other Georgetown, Georgetown, Colorado. <laughs> so I totally can relate to what you're talking about. And I look forward to uh, hearing the history. Yes. So this one in particular, I on the tour, it's only a couple of lines, but it has such an interesting backstory. And even getting to the story is secondary to one of our main stops, which is the Exorcist House. And this is the story of the house and the woman who lived there before, Mrs. Eden Southworth. So she is, she's born in 1819. She's like the ultimate Washingtonian, born in some house that George Washington developed. Her father dies when she's young, and then he has a priest rechristen her, because originally her name is just Emma, and has her rechristened Emma Dorothy Eliza Nevitt. So it spells out Eden, which is just delightful and mysterious. (laughs) And a lot of the things that people write about her say it's kind of a look into her future for what she ends up doing. So her father dies when she is five. As a child, she's running around and describes herself as a dark, wild-eyed elf even though she thinks she's shy and unattractive. Her father remarries and her stepfather and she do not quite get along. Um, He's very strict with her. So she, as soon as she can, becomes a teacher at 16. And then she marries at 21 to this inventor from New York. And they move to Wisconsin to like the frontier in a log cabin. And it is not her jam at all. Um, (laughs) But she does have 
two children while she's there, her son, and then she's pregnant with her second child, Charlotte, in 1844 when she, like, returns to Washington, D.C. without her husband. She comes back, and she is teaching for the public schools, and she starts writing, and she's going to become one of the most prolific novelists of her time. Like, she ends up on par with Harriet Beecher Stowe and Mark Twain, but she's not often remembered nowadays, Mm -hmm. even though at the time she was, like, one of the highest paid authors of her day. She starts doing all this writing while she's living in D.C. Her first novel is a serial published in 1949. And then in 1956, she signs a deal with the New York Ledger. And this is when she's making like $10,000 a year, which is so much money in 1856. Sure. Her first huge novel gets published in 1859 and it's called The Hidden Hand. And it's kind of, it's a really strong example of the overall themes of her work. It's a young girl named Capitola Black who is abandoned and a bit tomboyish. And a lot of her work talks about feminist issues of the day, like the idea of the perfect Victorian woman, all of that domesticity and all of those things. And she continues writing. She does, like, over 60 novels. Most of them are serials. They're published in newspapers and magazines. I was looking through some of her lesser, not lesser, well, I mean, they're all lesser known, but the less noted in the articles. And in 1860, she writes one called The Haunted Homestead. And there's a part of it called the Gilberts, which is now completely next on my things to read as soon as my new glasses arrive in the mail this month. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because I want to be able to soak it all in. But she's doing all of this writing while she is living in D.C. and still kind of teaching and raising her kids alone as a single woman. And she ends up moving into Prospect Cottage. And Prospect Cottage sits at 36th and Prospect, currently where the Exorcist House and Stairs are. So this is the whole haunted history, even before we get to the spooky, scary movie. We're not entirely sure when Prospect Cottage is built, but it is said to have been occupied by a former French minister. And sources say that Mrs. Southworth is there as late as the 1860s or earlier than like 1853. So we're not entirely sure when she lands there, but once she does, it becomes well known that that is her house. It's Carpenter Gothic, which is a very exciting, popular pre-Civil War style. But nowadays, it looks like a gingerbread house because of all of the, they call it barge board. So it's like little icicles that hang off the, the house. And it overlooks the Potomac and Virginia. And that's where most of her stories are set. Um, and it has this big old river, veranda that wraps around the side. And she lives there from, we'll say, the early 1850s up until her death in 1899. And she lives there for the majority of the American Civil War. She is a Union supporter. She lives very close to the Confederate border. It's She can see it from her house. Wow. And she has a kind of a front row seat to a lot of these events, including things like Lincoln's second inaugural, which she attends. She volunteers at Seminary Hospital, which is another stop on the tour that I talk about Mrs. Southworth on. She lets the hospital use her house for soldiers that still need a place to um, to convalesce and recover. At some point, they said she had like 27 soldiers staying there. 
And then wow. this is where we get to our first kind of spooky story about the property. Um, legend says that after the Second Battle of Bull Run, it was a decisive Confederate victory. They beat the Union Army, which was like twice as large as them. And all of the residents of Georgetown of D.C. were very concerned that the Confederates were going to come in, they were going to just completely overrun the city, and so she barricades herself in her house because it's one of the first places that they would arrive when they cross, like, the bridge from Virginia into the district. And so she barricades herself in the door, or in the house, and she stands there and she says, there's only three of us here, what are we going to do if the Confederates come? And a voice from the darkness responds, there are four of you here and you'll be fine. And they are. Mm. Yes. She lives out um, the rest of her life, passes away in 1899, and she is buried in Oak Hill Cemetery up the hill where we do not go on the ghost tour, mostly because it's uphill. Um, okay. So she dies, her son inherits the house, and then he dies and then her daughter inherits it. Um, but she lives up in New York. She has zero interest in the property. And so it gets sold and bought a few times. At one point, they say that there was this gr Italian grocer, I think it was, who sets his cart up in front of the house. And as he's setting up and getting ready to sell things, Mrs. Southworth comes walking out of the garden to have a chat with him. Uh, and because he's a local, he knows that she had passed several years before. So he just runs, leaving all of his stuff in front of the house. It then becomes, some people call it a tourist trap. I like to think it was like a delightful little oddity. So Prospect Cottage becomes an ice cream parlor. It has an ice cream parlor in the sitting room. The drawing room is a cafe and they sell ice cream and lunches and they have a drink Coca-Cola sign, and they sell live bait and cigars and tobacco. And it's a really popular spot for people to sit and wait for all of the streetcars that would run through Georgetown back in the day. They'd sit on the veranda, and it was such a popular spot because she was still such a famous novelist. Visitors would rip, like, giant hunks of wood or splinters out of the house. As souvenirs, and they would catch, like, bugs to take them home and be like, this is from Mrs. Southworth's house. Oh, wow. And they also say if that wasn't enough, Mrs. Southworth was still around to have a chat. She would frequently appear inside the house, um, and passersby said she could often be seen walking the edges of the veranda, wringing her hands. And that is the haunted history before it's even the exorcist house. It gets bought by a woman's literary society in the 1920s. It's supposed to turn into a museum and then it's torn down in the forties and the current house is built shortly after, which is incredibly famous. So when you say the um, exorcist house, do you mean from the movie? Yes. The, okay. the 1973 film, this is the house that is in Georgetown. It's next to the giant stairs, which used to be 36th Street, would just continue down. And now that's one of the, I think one of the main reasons people take the tour, because they're like, we're going to go see the Exorcist stairs and, and where the movie was and stuff. And it's always great fun, but I like being able to say, oh no, it doesn't just start there. It starts like a hundred years before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. That is interesting. So do you have more stories? I've got quite a few. One of my favorite ones is the first story that I get to tell on the tour. And it's about the CNO Canal, which now is like a really nice, bougie, great place for photos and brunch. But when DC, well, when Georgetown was first founded in 1751. It was like an industry town. It was a seaport. There was all sorts of rough and tumble things going on down there. And the route that took the local police patrol 
through Georgetown comes to be known as Dead Man's Beat. So, you know, Canal gets built, was it's the 1820s. It's like incredibly busy and popular leading up to the American Civil War. They just renovated it and brought in a barge. It's like an 80 foot barge that they built in the port of Baltimore that they had to put in the canal in two pieces. And it'll be open for rides, I think, in the spring, which I'm excited about because I love boats. But back in the day, there's like all these pubs, these like like houses of ill repute, we shall call them, boarding houses, the sailors. So definitely a rough and tumble town. And all these rumors start going around about this one route that takes you through Georgetown by the CNO Canal and bad things keep happening to the police officers that go out on the beat. A lot of them are killed. Some of them just quit and they like won't explain themselves or they'll just never come back. A lot of them just straight up disappear. And this goes on for years. It gets a bit of a reputation and some officers don't quite believe it. There's one officer named Frank Burroughs who very much didn't believe in any of the superstitious stuff. He figured his biggest issue back out there would be bar fights or like stabbings or like rabid dogs and giant rats. (laughs) But he finally gets assigned to Dead Man's Beat and he goes out and he only lasts an hour. He gets as far as 32nd and Cherry Hill, which is now M Street. And then he goes running back to the precinct. He bangs on the door to be let in and he threatens to quit. He is done. He is never going to go back out there. And when they ask him, like, why you didn't believe anything, he is suddenly a believer. He said that that phantom police officer had, like, chased him down alleyways. It had threatened his life. It had been known to appear with razors threatening police, and later they could be killed in, like, a razor bar fight. So now that he's out there, all these stories he completely believes, and he runs as soon as he can. They say that his boss really liked him, and so instead of accepting his resignation, he promised him he could go on to desk duty, he would never have to go out onto Dead Man's Beat again, and that was the end of that. But uh, legend says that Frank Burroughs woke up the next morning and his hair had turned pure white from the shock of what he had seen the evening before, and the officer that took over for him disappears within a week of taking over oh. the dead man's beat. So the story persisted even after those who didn't believe it thought that they could make it through the night. So there was a phantom police officer. Is that what you said? Yeah. One of their own early 1800s kind of figure with a heavy wool coat and a hat. And that's how they knew that he was a police officer. Cause it was like the uniform coat, the uniform hat. And he would just appear and all you could see you couldn't even see his face you could just see red eyes staring out at you Ooh. Mm -hmm. so now you do ghost tours do you do other kinds of tours as well in georgetown dc is it georgetown dc Yeah, Georgetown in the District of Columbia. I pretty much exclusively do the Ghosts of Georgetown tour and Mm -hmm. sometimes the Wicked Georgetown tour, which is a lot of murders. I have a full-time job in the theater, so this is just my fun moonlighting gig that I get to do. Do you do it all year long? I do. And it's so interesting because people always expect October to be like it is our busiest month. But in the spring, we have a ton of visitors because that's when the schools come. And the kids, of course, want to go on the cool ghost tour instead of like the boring building tour. So pre-pandemic especially, like I loved having the kids out too because they ask the best weird questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I believe that. Do you want to talk about where we can find you? Yeah. I mean, those were my two, my two kind of main ones. I have another, I'm going to be a guest on Tour Guide Tell All for one of their Patreon episodes, sharing a completely different story from one of the tours. And that one was started by some of our other guides. 
I can be found at melissaleegilbert.com. And my Instagram is at Melissa on foot. And that's where all of my tour guide stuff is. My website is actually like mostly as theater artist things, but there is also a way to go to my shop and you can buy watercolors, several of which are of Georgetown. Oh, okay. Interesting. So what's the name of the podcast? Tour Guide what? Tour Guide Tell All. I've never heard of that. I should be listening to that. Oh, yeah, it's great. I tell my guests that I keep learning things from it, and this is my job. <laughs> I was closed last year. I didn't do any tours. But um, for me, it's the busy season right now. And I, how long have you been a tour guide? Oh, gosh. I moved back to D.C. in 2018. So... Yes. But I've always kind of had that like tour guidiness about me. My friends think it's funny because I can draw, I drop into like, it's like your customer service voice, your tour voice. Because I grew up in Arizona and we have like a little ghost town down the road where Clark Gable and his, one of his wives, Carol Lombard still haunt. And that was my kind of like first introduction in telling that story is I think like that that sleeping tour guide that it's been in me this entire time. And now I get to do it for a living. I know. I don't know how I ended up doing ghost tours, but I, I started the tour business thinking I would just do straight history tours because I live in a national historic landmark district. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me, Oh, you should do ghost tours. And I had already heard enough stories about Georgetown and people telling me stories about ghosts and hauntings and stuff like that and so I started doing them and they are so much more popular than his regular history tours in fact I've been on two documentaries one is called trails to the unknown and I'm in episode two of that in one of the museums here in town and then the other one is ghosts and ghost towns mm -hmm. and so we're, our town is featured in the last half hour of it and I guess I've become, because I live in a town of like a thousand people. Mm -hmm. So I've become the resident ghost expert. <laughs> yes, that is like life goals right there. <laughs> <laughs> I never even knew that that would happen. Do you believe in ghosts? Oh, absolutely. I 100% believe. I don't think that we see them as often as we think. But I do think there's that many out there. I accidentally took one of the ghosts home from my tour. How did that manifest? How did you know? Do you know which ghost it was? Or I do. It was the okay. nanny. And it was the the street lights in front of her house were going like on and off. And then it didn't happen ever again. And I noticed when I get home, I pull my car in. The street light goes off. And then I get out of my car and it turns on for me to walk in. And it happens no matter what time I get home, no matter what day. And if I'm going to like leave, I'll open the door and the light will go off and she won't turn it back on till I get home. So have you always been a believer? So I'm raised Catholic, which I think some somehow has like some sort of tie into this sense of like life going on and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just something about like, I think Oatman was my favorite place to visit growing up. That's where the, the Clark Gable thing was. And I was like obsessed okay. with him in high school. And then working in theater, there's so many theater ghost stories. Like, I know the human brain can try and like, think of ways to explain things. But our brains like we're not that smart. <laughs> I was thinking today because I've you know, I do the ghost tours and I've been really th thinking I need to come up with some new material or new way of telling things, find out more information about things. And <laughs> this is what I believe about myself and probably other people is that I think things are happening a lot, but I am so oblivious most of the time that I don't even notice it. Yes. And there's been a 
there's been a couple things that have happened that I have caught my attention. I've not been a believer. I always tell people that I'm a skeptic when I start my tours, but there have been a couple things since I've been doing the tours that have definitely rooted both of my feet in the side of I'm a believer. I know that there's something it's tied into energy and I don't know if we'll ever really understand it, but I had a young girl a couple years ago on a tour, her and her mother, she was having a lot of uh, experiences with the paranormal and her mother did not, you know, she wasn't weird about it. Instead, she looked at it as an opportunity to help her teenage daughter to uh, come to terms with it. And one of the things that she told me, the daughter, she said there was some kind of entity in her house, especially in her closet, in her bedroom. And it really scared her. And she would, you know, one night she was just so terrified, but so enraged at the terror, you know, like being afraid all the time. And she said to me, she said, and then I just yelled, what do you want from me? And she said, it stopped after that. And that her takeaway from that, exactly, that's exactly what her takeaway was from that. So, you know, kudos to her mother for, you know, helping her to come to terms with that sixth sense or whatever you want to call it. But I don't know. I just think that, you know, the things that I've experienced, and it might be the same for you, that it is, it's just a matter of acknowledging and, you know, seeing it and acknowledging it, right? Yeah. Well, and my my bit is I always tell the guests that I'm like, I love having skeptics because the ghosts know me. Like, they have nothing to prove with me. They know I'm on, like, I believe. So it's the people that aren't quite bought in. That's who they're trying to reach out to the most on the tours. Oh, interesting. So have you had experiences where... They've reached out on your tours, like you say? Yes. I get a lot of, like, lights and electrical activity. And it will be, like, in very specific spots um, at certain times of year. I've had a lot more since the pandemic has been, like, winding down and the guests have been returning. So I tell them that the that's the ghost excited to have them back. Uh, but the more I do it, the more I just have, like, all these little instances and... And like, I will, I will kind of brush it off sometimes, but then the guests will get really excited or they'll notice something or like a light will go on as soon as I say a certain word or get to a certain part in the story. So just having all those moments kind of like reaffirm, like there can't be that many coincidences, like when I've been doing this for years and years. Do you get, does it ever scare you? I have never been scared in Georgetown. I have, I think I've definitely been in places that I, I think it's because I'm so familiar with it. That's what it is. Like if I went somewhere haunted that I didn't know the history, I didn't know the stories. I think that would be a lot more scary for me. That makes, I just, that's a major understanding. That's why, oh, I, that's why I Wikipedia scary movies. Oh my gosh, I learned something about myself today. Thank you. Wikipedia scary movies? Yeah, I don't watch them. I read about them. I didn't even watch The Exorcist (laughs) until last year. Like, I'd been giving tours on the house. And I was like, I can't bring myself to watch it. But I was furloughed from my theater job. So I was visiting my mom in Arizona. And she is very Catholic. There were rosaries everywhere. And it was like bright sunshine middle of the day and it came on the tv and i thought this is my best shot anywhere else like this is gonna go wrong (laughs) okay and how was it for you do do you get scared watching movies is that what you're saying yes i do my brain just keeps going it it holds up Like, I think some, the special effects, you can kind of tell that it's a bit dated, but there's some, like, some of the analog tech that they used in the film, like, keeps it really spooky. And, like, as I said, I was raised Catholic, 
like altar server, like Latin, our father. So I, whew, I feel like I can't not believe. Do you think that there's like evil forces out there? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, thankfully, okay. there's not really any terrible ones in Georgetown. And I have i don't think I've come across any, but I absolutely believe that it exists out there. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I used to, when I was younger, I'd get scared. And I don't get scared anymore. And the things that have happened, they don't, the thought of them don't scare me. Like, when I was younger, things would scare me, but, and I don't know what that's about. I don't know if I feel like I'm protected or if they're, I don't know if I believe in demons and things like that. I'm not sure about that. I definitely don't think they're like as common, like as the, I, the movies would have us believe kind of a thing. Like, yeah, like yeah. It, reflecting humanity, sort of like I think there's more good in the world than bad, but some of the bad okay. can be really bad. Yeah, that's true. I am obsessed with true crime. So, oh, hello. <laughs> I don't. Hello, girl. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, I should have done a true crime podcast, but there's so many of them that I thought. I mean, I didn't even think about it because history is kind of my jam, but I love true crime. I can't get enough of it. What's yeah. your favorite true crime podcast? Oh, well, I mean, I am, I'm a murderino from like way back when. Okay. And I yeah. think, and I think that's the only one I've actually listened to. I watch a lot of documentaries. Like, okay, yeah. I'm really bad at having... Diff, like if I watch a whole series like in one go, so I'm really bad at keeping up with podcasts. I have to start late and then listen. Yeah, to okay, all. okay, yeah. Do you have Do you have Disco Discovery Plus? Oh no, I do not. But I've I've oh, heard. Oh, I'll tell you what. Oh yeah, it'll keep you in the true crime. Oh my god! I ended up signing up. I canceled Hulu and I signed up for Discovery Plus, and I okay pretty much every night. That's what I do is I watch true crime until I'm tired. Heck yeah. Discovery Plus. It's so soothing to lull you to sleep. I put it on when I take naps. What is that? I know what is that. It's I. I'll step back from myself watching these shows and think, why? Like that is disturbing to yeah. say the least. My boyfriend thinks it's disturbing. Oh yeah, no. It's ever <laughs> whenever I talk about the other the other tour that I give sometimes, I'm like it's basically my favorite murders in Georgetown. Like that's all it is. It's all the terrible stuff. But I don't know, maybe it's cuz then I don't have to think about it happening to me or like I don't have to think about the reality of it cuz it's all just a, something else. I don't know, but yeah. And I I think it's the way it's presented too. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's the narrative and the at the fact that I think for so many, like, there is an end point to it. Like, I'm not coming in in the middle or the beginning. I know yeah. for a certain, to a certain yeah. extent, it is concluded. We have really gone off the rails on yes. this, but I don't care because <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Anyways, true crime, it's my jam too. So I just don't know what I would, if I was going to do a true crime podcast, I don't know what angle I would do because there's so many of them. Yeah. And I'm just bad at continuing on with things. I started during the furlough. I started like an eight episode podcast for my theater to be like, oh, I'm just going to learn about stuff that has to do with the theater. And then I was just like, I'm bored. I'm done. <laughs> I was like, and I think about these podcasts that have been on for years and years. And I'm just like, how do you keep going? Oh, my gosh. Mad respect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, um, anything else? Is there anything about this history that I didn't ask you that you wanted to share? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I think that I my favorite thing about the history and the tours is it is really different standing where it is instead of reading about it. Like I had never had a great interest in colonial history or civil war history until I started giving these tours. And now I am 
genuinely more interested in how everything happened because I'm like, oh, I stand in front of that house all the time. These are the same streets. There is something so wonderful about being able to like be in that same human space as so many people yes, yes. so many years before you. Yeah. There is something really powerful about the physicality of it. Yep, I agree. Is there anything else you want to say about where people can find you and that type of thing? Uh, Yeah. So I give my tours with free tours by foot. DC by foot is that branch. And we offer ghost tours in cities all around the world. But in DC, we have three, the White House, Ghost Capitol Hill Ghosts, and Georgetown Ghosts. And we talk about all sorts of different haunted history, including my upcoming also guest episode, with a different ghost story on Tour Guy Tell All. Oh, people, you're going to have to go out there and like listen to all these episodes to get the stories. Yes. And then I'm going to have to tell them <laughs> on that one that they have to come listen to Armchair Historians to get these stories. Oh, yeah. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you, Melissa. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be on such a wonderful, historical, and amazing podcast. There you have it. If you fancy a haunted walk in the neighborhood of Georgetown, be sure to look up Melissa. For more information on Melissa, including her cat's Instagram page, whose handle is at Blake the Shake, be sure to check out our episode notes. Thanks for joining us. And in light of the fact that Halloween is this Sunday, I hope you have a haunted week. Thank you.